When I say Tony Stewart, what do you think about? Is it three-time Sprint Cup Series champion? Is it Triple Crown champion? Or is it IndyCar champion? What about NASCAR team owner? Well, our very own Megan Kolb asked that same question when she sat down with Tony to talk about the business side of racing and his other business ventures. So Tony, the last time that I had the opportunity to sit down with you was for the Formula One seat swap. Since then, your resume has not only grown as a driver, but also as a businessman. When you look at businessman versus driver, what would you put first? I would still, hands down, take the race car driver part. Uh, the business side is a lot more challenging to me. It's a, a lot more difficult. It's, uh, you worry a lot more on the business side, but uh, you know, we, we definitely get to balance it out with the, the driver side still. What do you enjoy most about the business side of motorsports? Well, I think it just since I started as a kid, it just becomes so passionate about it. And you know that at some point uh, that you're not gonna drive a race car anymore. I mean, there's, there's gonna be that day that you have to stop and having race tracks and having open wheel teams and cup teams now. Now there's, now there's a plan for what's, what's life gonna be like after driving. So it's not the question anymore of what am I, what am I gonna do if I get injured and can't drive or I you know, have to retire for some reason. What will I do with the rest of my life? We, we, we have these things in place now. The partnership with Gene Haas, was that a long time coming or how did that relationship even form for you guys? Rick Hendrick gave me a call one day and said, I, I think I have a unique opportunity you might be interested in. And he went over all the details of, of what Gene was offering. And uh, I wasn't really looking to leave Joe Gibbs Racing. I, you know, we won two championships with him. I'd been with Zipidelli and Home Depot there for 10 years and was happy there. But this was an opportunity that was a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to do something different, to be able to go and, and be a Joe Gibbs and be a Rick Hendrick and be a part of the ownership side and uh, you know that that was a pretty big step for Gene Haas to to make me an offer like that. Stuart Haas Racing now four car operation was that always the vision? That's actually what Gene Haas's vision has been from day one. Um, you know when I joined Stuart Haas Racing and, and joined Gene's operation we were a two car team and so we, we knew that that's what his plan was down the road. There was no time frame on when it would expand to that. Uh, the thing that I promised everybody at the shop was that we would make sure that we had two competitive teams that were capable of participating in the chase before we added a third team. Is it scary at all? Four Absolutely. cars? Absolutely. Yes. There's a lot of nights that I go to bed and I'm like, what am I doing? And have I bit off more than I can chew? But it's where you have to rely on the people that, that you surround yourself with and that takes a lot of that load off. Well you have the good people that work for you, what about the talent behind the cars? I'm excited, I'm excited about our lineup. Um, you know having Danica back is great for me. Uh, she's the only teammate now that I've worked with at Stuart Haas more than a year and I've not really had a chance to work with Kurt a lot but Kurt and Kevin have worked a lot together uh, and Kevin and I have worked a lot together with the Nationwide side so um, I'm excited about it. I mean, we're we're definitely going to be the bad boy team of NASCAR for sure. Yeah. Uh, with <laughs> with a bad girl there too as well. She's got a little temper that fits right into the program. But uh, the great thing is, uh, it's it's been so much fun to see how excited Danica is about Kurt coming on board and Kevin coming on board, and uh, the same with with. Kurt and Kevin. I mean, they're both just so excited to come in. Danica with the team backing her. Has there been challenges? What has she done for Stuart House Racing bringing her on? She's brought a lot of enthusiasm. You know, I, I think there were a lot of questions of how is this going to work? What's it going to be like? For the guys at the shop is how do we how do we work with her as far as, you know, making sure they don't say the wrong things or do the wrong things around her. And she immediately put all that to rest when she came to the shop the first time. I mean, she started busting on the guys, uh, but she's just made everybody very, very comfortable. But there's just an extra little glow when she's there. I mean, everybody's excited about her. And, and you know, we realize we're, you know, just like Daytona and qualifying, that we're, we're setting records with her and uh, that we're all a part of it together. What about another championship in the near future for SHR? I have to say I'm, I'm probably, more confident now than ever that it, it's it's definitely in the radar. I've never seen everybody so excited as they are right now. I mean, they really 
are enjoying the fact that having Danica back, having Kurt and Kyle come in, and, and the growth. It's just, it, it is, it's been an unbelievable atmosphere, and I think we really have the ingredients to, to go out and contend. I, I, I don't see why we can't get three cars in the chase next year, and, you know, God willing, we, you know, Danica's come a long way in a short amount of time, and if we get her in the chase, that just be an unbelievable season. We like to refer to you kind of as the Rick Hendrick of grassroots type racing. You know, going from SHR to TSR, you in 13 years have gone from a one car team to a five car team and have, I believe, 16 championships. What's it like hearing those statistics? Uh, it's fun. I, I, I'm still very, very passionate about short track racing, dirt track racing. Uh, you know, we started our first TSR team in 2001 with Danny Lasoski, and, and it's just grown from there. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I, I tell everybody I get the best of both worlds. I, I get to go and compete with the best stock car drivers in the country every weekend. And then I either get to go watch or get to participate myself with the best dirt track drivers in the country. So it's, um, it's a great way for me to be a part of a great large sport like NASCAR, but at the same time not forget where I came from and stay involved there as well. More dirt racing. Let's talk Eldora, a little bit of a newer business venture. Is it just a dream come true being a track owner there? It is. Um, you know, Eldora is one of those tracks that um, it's it's iconic. I mean, there's dirt tracks across the country that you think of, whether uh, you start on the West Coast with Chico and uh, you know Knoxville, Eldora, Williams Grove. Uh, there's just tracks that that no matter where you're at in the country, that if you're a dirt track racer, you know those places. And uh, you know, Eldora is a place I'm I'm really proud to be a part of and, and proud of you know where it's come the last you know eight years now. Making history with the NASCAR trucks running out there, is the event everything that you imagined it would be? Oh ab absolutely. It was much more it, it turned out much better than I anticipated. It it really was uh, it honestly caught me off guard a little bit when we when we had practice on Tuesday and then went into the the, the racing on Wednesday. Uh, you know I you sat there and you think about teams that have never been to Eldora, so they didn't have setup sheets for it. You had drivers that had never been to Eldora and drivers that had never ran on dirt before. And I thought this is this could be a recipe for disaster. And to sit there and watch the first 30 minutes of practice uh, on top of the tower in the infield and watch these guys learn, it was absolutely amazing to me uh, to watch drivers and teams figure it out so quickly. Um, but the racing at the end of the day, the, I think it took 30 laps into the race before I finally just relaxed and enjoyed it as a fan. There's been a little bit of buzz of you starting up an off-season type series. Is there any future plans for that still? We've talked about it. Um, you know, Jimmy Carr, who crew chiefs my World of Outlaws team, and uh, you know, as our competition director for the programs in Indianapolis, uh, you know, it was really his idea. Uh, you know, we think back to the winter heat racing series that used to run out in Arizona, and uh, you know, that's kind of what where Jimmy's thought process was. There's so many drivers that go to Australia for the winter to race, and we thought, well, would some of these guys stay, and would more of the teams want to compete in the winter if they had the opportunity? So, uh, you know, I think it's something we're, we're definitely interested in looking at it. I think there's a demand for it now. I think there's teams that want to race longer into the season um, and, and would enjoy a, a five or six week stretch where they could race in the same spot. The National Motorsports Press Association Myers Brothers Award. Tell us about this honor. I never in my wildest dreams would have uh, anticipated I'd even been nominated for an award like that, let alone uh, receive it. But. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's voted on by the press, which that in itself, for me to win an award by the press is, is a pretty big deal for me because <laughs> we've always had a love-hate relationship, but, um, you know, they've always given that award for outstanding contributions to the sport, and, uh, you know, I don't feel like that I've done any more than anybody else, uh, but I, it, it's a huge honor. Uh, I, I had no clue, uh, which made it even that much better 
That just was, it caught us off guard out of the blue, but it was, it's something that's uh, very humbling and, and very flattering. Now that you've learned about the business side of Tony Stewart, Natalie Sather sits down to talk about his injury and recovery, plus his love of animals and charitable works. Well, Tony, we covered the business side, we covered the racing side, and now I want to get a little bit personal with you. You were injured in a sprint car racing accident this summer. Take me through the crash. We, uh, we just got the lead two laps before and had five laps to go and uh, went into turn three and a car toward the tail end of the lead lap hit one of the inside marker tires and it spun him sideways in the middle of the track and when the tire got pushed through the infield it kicked a bunch of dust up. Well, it came over the track to where I couldn't see through it and it, I've watched the video a million times and it looks like I'm driving right off the end of the nose wing and just drove into him, but I could not see through the dust. When I got on the back side of it, he was sitting sideways, and I just had time to get out of the gas and try to turn it to the left. And, you know, you've driven sprint cars enough to know you can't, you aren't going to turn them to the right. So instead of hitting him in the cockpit, I hit, hit my right rear against his left front. And when it broke the suspension and everything in the rear, it let the rear end housing droop, and that's what made the drive line come apart and break my leg. After everything was done and you were sitting there, did you know the severity of your injury? Could you tell that your leg was broken or what were your emotions? For a scenario like this, it was, if you had to get in a wreck like that and have the injury that we had, it, we couldn't have asked for anything during what happened from the crash on to be any better than it was. The first guy to me was Jay Mercer, who is a doctor. He asked me if I was all right and I'm still gathering my thoughts, but my first thought was I've raced enough to know that they want to know if you have any back pain, neck pain. Uh, I didn't have either of those and I didn't even have a headache, which felt odd to me because we always get a little bit of a zinger headache when you crash like that. And then I looked down because I couldn't feel my right leg and then saw it was pointing a direction that wasn't its original position. So uh, I told him, I said, my legs broke. Um, but it, it, it was really odd because you know, the pain, I probably, the pain was probably 30% of what the injury really was. It, I didn't really notice it that bad. But getting out of the car was painful and getting in the ambulance, that whole process. But, um, you know, as far as being in good hands, we, we, we couldn't have asked for a better situation. When we least expect it, life sets us up for a challenge to test our courage and willingness to change. Has this changed you at all? It definitely has. Um, I went from being the busiest driver in the Cup Series to, in a matter of seconds, being stuck in bed 24-7 for weeks. So you have no other choice but a lot of spare time and a lot of opportunity to think about things and see things from a different angle and a different light. And even during the recovery process, it's been you know going back to the tracks and being able to watch. Uh, you know, watch my own cup teams run, it gives, has given me a great uh, difference in perspective on how things, how we do things and what's going on and listening to Ryan and Matt Borland communicate and Danica and Tony Gibson and listening to Mark Martin and Steve Addington talk this year. It really was good for me to hear different driver crew chief combinations and how they communicate with each other and how important that really is. I, I don't talk a lot on the radio and it's, it's told me that I probably need to do a better job of communicating what's going on with my race car. You yourself have, have said you're brutally honest and you kind of have this bad boy image in NASCAR. Are we going to still continue to see that or are we going to see a little bit of a different Tony Stewart now? It only broke my leg. It didn't break the rest of me. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I mel I've mellowed a lot in the last couple of years, but I, I I'm still one of those guys. I don't really have a lot of filter in me. Mm -hmm. If I'm passionate about something, I'm going to fight for it all the time. So, uh, you know, I think that's kind of made us what we are is the fact. And, and I think that's where a lot of our fan bases come from is because we call it like we see it. We don't just conform to what everybody wants us to be. We, we have our own identity because of that. In 2010, a young AMA pro racer, Eric Saunders, who you've watched grow up racing. He was um, injured practicing for an upcoming race and paralyzed from the waist down. You wrote something on his wall after your accident. 
How has he influenced you with this life-changing accident that happened to you? You know, when Eric got hurt, I mean, his whole family, I mean, that's what they all centered around was his racing. And, uh, you know, when he got hurt, it's, you, you look at a kid that's gets in a wreck the day before his 18th birthday and you sit there and go, you hear about it and you know all across the country, you hear stories about it all the time. And I think that was the first time that it ever hit close to home for us. Uh, and going and seeing Eric in the hospital and how positive he was about everything. Uh, you know, I, I remember Daryl Gwynn coming to see me when I was in bed and um, he asked, he goes, how you doing? I go, oh good, you know, this is starting to heal up. And he, he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, how are you doing? And it made me think, you know, how am I really doing? And, and at the time, I, I was really surprised how positive I was through the beginning of the process. But there's a part of the process where I understood why Daryl was asking, because there's a part where you just get frustrated. And it's not, it's not about feeling sorry about yourself. It's you get frustrated just because you get for me, it was, I got tired of asking for help, but that's, that was kind of, I read something that Eric could put on his Facebook page that night, and it just made me think about, you know, here's a kid that his life changed forever. It, mine was temporary, you know, I'm up and moving around again, and Eric doesn't have that luxury, but he's taken the cards he's dealt, and he said, all right, I'm, I'm not going to just lay around and feel sorry for myself. He, he's a huge inspiration to so many people. And, and he has been an inspiration to me too. And that's, that's been part of the healing process. It's not just the physical healing, it's the mental healing that you have to go through when you have an injury like this that, uh, you know, it seems like the, the, the mental healing is faster than the leg is, but it, they both have to happen. And it's, you know, there's never been a part of me that's been scared to get back in a race car or debated whether I ever wanted to get in one again. It's just, when am I going to get in one? How soon can I get in one? You know, when I read that, it just made me sit back and think and just kind of tell him how much of an inspiration he is. And, and he knows it, but how much it really hits to people that I don't think he realizes it, it touches sometimes. Who has been your biggest supporter, cheerleader to get you back going, get you motivated and want to, you know, get back in a race car as soon as you can? Uh, that's probably the hardest answer because I don't think there was just one person. In the first 36 hours after I had the crash, I, I got 850 text messages. Wow. And it was from car owners in the Cup Series to I got a text from a Formula One driver to my best friends at home uh, and everywhere in between. It was just, the support was, uh, it was just unbelievable. That's that's motivation enough. Have you ever doubted maybe how your performance is going to be? Are you nervous about getting back into a car? I think therapy has probably been the part that's made me go, okay, what's how's this going to work, and is it going to be strong enough? I'm going to, am I going to have enough? Uh, you know, the the amount that I can move my ankle on my right side is less than the left, so. I'm, sitting there thinking about all the throttle linkages and all the cars that I drive, is it, is it going to be long enough to do that and are we going to have to change things? But I think the surgeon and the therapist alone have given me the confidence to not question whether I'm going to be able to do it. It's just how long is it going to take? You also have a unique passion for animals and helping out children. You're actually having the Catch a Dream Foundation come out, which helps chronically ill children. How good does that make you feel to be able to help children like that? These are kids that, you know, having an injury like this, this injury is nothing compared to what these kids are going through. But for them to come out and come out and hunt for a couple of days and and be around Johnny Morris and, and uh, be able to come to our place, it's something we enjoy. It's it's neat to be able to share this with these kids. And, um, you know, it's it's a good reminder at the end of the year when you're all, we're always wore out. Everybody's tired. They're mentally fatigued, physically wore out after the season's over and to spend a couple days and have a kid that's going through a life-threatening illness, spend a couple days with them, it, you forget about how tired you are and frustrated you are with if you didn't have a good season. Now, animals, what do you do to help animals? How did you get that passion? 
I just have always been an animal person. I don't know where I came up with the passion for them, but there's a lot of rescue groups. You know, Chrissy and Ryan Newman have Rescue Ranch in North Carolina. But we, you know, we've helped the DNR in our area with rescued fawns. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we've uh, retired racehorses from Kentucky That's that cool. we've helped rehabilitate, and now they're pets for people. It, it's just, I've just always been an animal person, and you know, we've had a monkey, we've sponsored a tiger, um, dogs, cats, I've had birds, I've had a rabbit, iguanas, and now i got a pig. So uh, I, I think we've covered, we need a giraffe, an elephant, <laughs> yeah. and, a, and some chickens, and we'll have out. everything. Yeah. So, uh, but I'm just, I just like animals for some reason. I don't know what it is, I've, I've always been that way. Well, Tony, thank you for letting us come into your home, sit down and talk with you. We really appreciate it. And Good luck next year. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. That's it for another Three Wide Life. Thank you so much to Tony and his team for letting us come out and talk with him about the business side of racing, his injury, and his philanthropy. Next week, I'm going to sit down with Tony and talk about his motorsports career, where he came from, and how he got to this high level. As always, make sure you're checking our Twitter, our Facebook, and our website for ongoing content. And until next time, keep living the Three Wide Life.